uh, let's begin formally then. And for me, that means acknowledging the creator of us all, of all things, and also acknowledging my elders. And that's quite a few folk. I'm 51. I think there are a few people who are a little older than 51. And so for those who are, do I have your permission to begin? Yes. All right? Formally, ashe. And when we say ashe, that just means, and so it is. That's an affirmation. And I'm finding, too, that in various parts of the African world, they do the same things, but they have different terminology for it. For example, if I were to greet you, um, in the Egyptian context, we, we, we might say hotep, which just means peace. But I just left East Africa. And if you say hotep over there, most people won't know what you're talking about. They would say jambo. Okay, in Ghana, it will be something different. But all of that, I suppose, is a part of the cultural unity of African people. Now, I started something like this on the bus the other day, but I wasn't able to look at you, which is probably a good thing, because I think most of y'all were asleep anyway. If you weren't asleep at the beginning, you were asleep at the end. I'm told I'm a very good cure for insomnia. I should try to you know, package that, and I could make a lot of money, and then we could all have these trips for free. So let me summarize some of those things and also include some of the stuff that I didn't get a chance to tell you about. I'm not going to keep you too long, maybe about 45 minutes or so, and then we can have some discussion. I would imagine you all want to do some things before we pull out of here um, and talk about some of the scholars who have been doing this kind of work and also another important aspect, and this is the conversion of Moors in, uh, into Christians and also the dispersal of Moors into other parts of Europe. I think that's a very important chapter. Before we get started, let me just show you two photographs, and these are the principal books I'm going to be referring to. I think Sister Helen was asking me about this right here, and I think some of you all have probably seen this photograph. Have you seen this before? Yeah. yeah. This is, the book itself is called The Story of the Moors in Spain by Stanley Lane Poole, who is a European, an Englishman, and I think the book was published in the 1880s, I think specifically 1886. I can look here on the copyright. This is a reprint. And one of the good things about utilizing European sources is that if you're an African, like I am, like we are, and you use, uh, and you're talking about this kind of stuff, people will say it's just feel-good history. Uh, you Africans are just vindicationists. You're making up stuff that really didn't happen. So sometimes I go out of my way to uh, use European references because many of them were honest enough to tell the truth as they saw it about African history or the African presence in world history, and you cannot say that they were Afrocentrist or they had an African bias. Some people, I think, are able to transcend race, at least to some extent. And so therefore, those European scholars who are able to do that, I give them great praise. For example, you have a guy in, um, a Frenchman named Count Valdney. He was made, this is a man named Valdney who was made a count by Napoleon, who went to Egypt, I think, 10 years before the Napoleonic invasion or expedition of Egypt. He went in 1788, Valdney did, and he described the Sphinx. And he said that in ancient times, there lived a great people, a black people, Black people uh, are people with black skin, with frizzy hair or woolly hair who erected ancient Egyptian civilization. This is 1788. And then you also have an Englishman named Gerald Massey. These are just two that stand out. Gerald Massey wrote a series of books. The most important, the first one is called A Book of the Beginnings in 1881. And then in 1884, another big, these are big fat books, two volume books. Um, this one is called Natural Genesis. But the crowning glory was in the 20th century, I think 1903 or 1907, and this is a book called Ancient Egypt, The Light of the World. It's been reprinted many times, like this has been reprinted. This is, a, I think, a 1985 reprint by Black Classic Press in Baltimore, and the foreword is by one of my teachers, a man named John G. Jackson, who's an ancestor now. But uh, in this book, um, Ancient Egypt, The Light of the World, which I think Black Classic Press also reprinted, uh, he says, Massey says, um, this is an expression that comes out of it, Africa the birthplace and Egypt the mouthpiece. In other words, Africa was where it first began, but it was in Egypt, a particular part of Africa, that it was refined and polished and presented to the rest of the world. And even before Massey uh, and after Volney, in 1836, you have the publication of another large book called Anacalypsis, 
And Anacalypsis is written by another Englishman named Godfrey Higgins. And Higgins was a retired um, uh, colonel in the English army who served in India in the late um, 18th century. And he wrote this huge book. He, he says it took him 20 years to write the book. I don't know how long it took him to research the book, but 20 years to write the book. And he said at the end of the book, I found something black whenever I approach the origins of nations and religions. And so it's good to be able to use people like that to corroborate the work that African people themselves are doing. Now, I started talking the other day. Yes. It's called Anacalypsis. And let me spell it. I think it's A-N-A-C-A-L-Y-P-S-I-S. -S. And it has a long, long, long subtitle, too. Anacalypsis, the author is Godfrey, Godfrey Higgins. Now, we've heard a lot of different names for example, sisters and brothers, we've heard the name Phoenician quite a lot, haven't we? Now, who are the Phoenicians? First of all, that's not what the people call themselves. We should be aware of that, uh, that a lot of, we're aware of the fact that a lot of times the names we use are not, for people, are not the names that the people themselves used. Ancient Americans didn't call themselves Indians. They didn't call themselves that. That name we know comes as a, uh, comes as a result. I must be a little nervous. Y'all are making me nervous. <laughs> comes as a result of Cristoforo Colombo, also known as Columbus, Christopher Colon, who got lost going to what he hoped would be India. And he tried to bamboozle the Spanish monarchs and claim that it was India. In fact, he even had his sailors sign a document that said we had landed in India. And subsequently, the people have been called Indians. The Phoenicians are like that, too. The word Phoenician comes from the Greeks. And it wasn't a nation. It was a chain of coastal cities on, uh, in southern Syria and on the west coast of Lebanon. And I was very fortunate over the last year to go to both Syria and Lebanon and visit many of those um, Phoenician cities. You have a big one called Byblos. It's magnificent. It's right on the ocean. And Byblos is particularly important because that's where we get the word Bible. At least that's an argument that it's derived from Byblos. And I met some of the friendliest people in the world in that part of the country. One night I was looking for an internet cafe and I was lost. Coming from my hotel to the internet cafe, I knew that if I didn't touch a keyboard that night, I wasn't going to be able to function. I had to find this internet cafe. And so I'm wandering through this neighborhood, and people are looking at me funny. And finally, I asked somebody, do you know where the internet cafe was? And they thought I was looking for something to eat. So they directed me to a restaurant, and somebody heard me. And they said, oh, you want a cyber cafe? And I said, yeah. And they said, well, it's over there. So I started to walk in that direction, and somebody ran out after me and took me by the arm and would not let me go and walked me that four or five blocks to the place. So I got there right across the street from the internet cafe. I saw it. I was about to go. He said, no, 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 no. You come with me. And he made sure that he walked me to the door. I used the internet cafe, and then they wouldn't charge me anything. Just very nice hospitality. This was in Byblos. You also have another one in ancient times, a very powerful Phoenician city, and that one is called Sidon. But probably the most important one is called Tyre, T-Y-R-E. And the Phoenicians are important. The word Phoenician uh, apparently is derived, um, it's based on the word, uh, on, the, on the color purple. Um, the Phoenicians were associated with, with the color purple, like a color of royalty. Maybe that's where the Romans got that from. At any rate, Tyre is a big city. And the reason the Phoenicians are important is because of two things. First, they are great sailors. They are the greatest sailors in ancient times. And so they sailed all from, they sailed from uh, Syria and Lebanon, and they landed all over Northwest Africa, in Southern Europe, in Spain, uh, in France, but they went all the way to Cornwall in England. This is 3,000 years ago. And some people even say that they are responsible for the megalithic monument on the Salisbury Plain in England called uh, Stonehenge, which I'm sure you've heard of. People say that the Phoenicians did that. But they also landed all over Northwest Africa. So they are great sailors. They established these colonies. They're great traders. 
but they are also credited with having introduced the alphabet. So Phoenicians go down in history for those two achievements. So all over this area, in Spain and North Africa, you will have Phoenician colonies or Phoenician settlements. For example, the biggest one is called Carthadas, K-H-A-R-T hyphen H-A-D-D-A-S. And the Romans called that Carthage. The word Carthadas means the new town. And it was established by colonists from Tyre in 814 B.C. They landed and they integrated with the black people in northern Africa, in Tunisia and Algeria, and they established a city-state that is in power for hundreds and hundreds of years. And of course, the greatest of Carthan families is called the Barca or Barca family, B-A-R-C-A. -A. And uh, it was one of the Barca's, the father of Hannibal, who founded the Spanish city of Barcelona. So this is very important. And Hannibal himself has African blood. I was going to show you a, a depiction of what we believe to be Hannibal from ancient times. And Hannibal is one of the greatest military um, uh, geniuses of all time. A very bold man who, when he was 13 years old, swore undying hatred to the Roman Empire because the Romans were trying to wipe the Carthaginians out. You have Carthage in Africa, and then you have Rome in southern Europe. So you have this conflict, first with the Greeks, then with the Romans, to see who was going to exercise supremacy. And the Carthaginians were determined, I mean, the Romans were determined to destroy the Carthaginians. So when uh, um, Hannibal is 13, he declares undying hatred to the Roman Empire. And when he's 21 years old, he is elected democratically the commander in chief of the Carthaginian army. This 21 year old kid, young man. And he says, the best way to defeat the Romans is to go to Rome. Don't wait for them to come here. Let's go get them. And that establishes his fame. Hmm. So he takes an army, an African army, Carthaginian and all kind of African mercenaries, including the people called the Moors, into Europe, into Spain. And they cross the Alps. And he has a large contingent of African war elephants. Most of those elephants were lost crossing the Alps, but he went all the way to the gates of Rome. And he destroyed one Roman army after the other. And the Romans were terrified. They thought the end was coming. But the Romans wore the Carthaginians down. And then you have a Roman general with the interesting name Scipio Africanus. Some people even think that Africa is named after this Roman, Scipio Africanus, but it, that's not the case. Africanus means conqueror of Africa. So the name Africa is already in the place. And he has a strategy similar to Hannibal. He says, we will never defeat the Carthaginians if we fight a defensive battle. Let's go to Africa. So they lead the Roman army into Africa, and then they do something else that we should be very familiar with. They divide and conquer. They separated the African contingent. For example, there's a group of Africans in the uh, Carthaginian army called the Numidians. It's probably from the word Numidian that we derive the word nomad. And they divide them up. And so they no longer fight alongside the Carthaginians. Anyway, Carthage is ultimately defeated in three wars. And they're called the Punic Wars. And then the last one, the Romans said, we're going to get rid of the Carthaginians once and for all. And they burn Carthage to, the, I've been to Carthage. They burn Carthage to the ground. They say Carthage burned for 40 days and 40 nights before the fires went out. And then the Romans took plows and bullocks and sowed uh, salt into the ground so nothing, no crops would ever grow there again. And finally, I think it's around 55 BC that one of the greatest of the Romans, somebody we've all heard of, Julius Caesar, goes to Carthage. He's uh, on his way to give battle somewhere, because the Romans were always killing somebody. They go to give battle somewhere, and Caesar has a dream, a nightmare. And the night in the nightmare, he's told Carthage must be rebuilt. And so Carthage is rebuilt, but it's built as a Roman city. So if you go to Carthage today in Tunisia, you only see a little bit of the original African city. Most of the rest is Roman. Now the Romans themselves. Can I ask you one question? Yes. Yes. And the Barca family, I don't know if it's pronounced Barca or Barca, these are some tough Africans. And they are called the Lion's Brood. <laughs> the Lion's Brood. These are some tough people. I would have liked to have met them. Okay? Ali would have felt right at home 
among the Barca family, okay? Now, the Romans. These civilizations are not monolithic in terms of, ethni uh, in terms of the ethnicity. And by the second century, you begin to have non-Romans or non-Italians um, who assume very important positions, even before then, but particularly in the first and second centuries AD, non-Romans, uh, are, are traditionally non-Romans, begin to be very important. For example, you have two Spanish emperors, one named Hadrian and another named Trajan. And Trajan apparently was a very liberal man. In fact, Trajan's uh, leading military commander was an African who was a Moor. And he was picked as Trajan's successor. But when Trajan died, you know, other people stepped in and um, prevented this African from taking his place. This is well documented in a book called Rome in Africa. It's an excellent book, Rome in Africa, by a woman named Susan Raven. It's a superb book, the best book on the subject I think that's ever been written. It's still in print. I think it was reprinted about 1995. You can get it. It costs you about $30 paperback. If you can get it and add it to your library, you won't, be, you won't regret it. Raven, like the bird, R-A-V-E-N. Thus quoth the raven, nevermore. <laughs> now I'm in a good mood. I love what I do. Does it come out? The passion that I have for it? It's like God has given us all something, and this is what I got. I may not be worth a damn in anything else, but as a historian, I'm not too bad, okay? Or so I think. A legend in my own mind, right? Now the Romans and the African presence among the Romans. So after the Spanish emperors, it's the Africans part. And the most prominent African emperor, and I'm doing all this deliberately because all this we're gonna be impacted upon if we haven't been already over the days to come. You have a brother named Septimius Severus. And I had this nice black painting of Septimius Severus, as far as I know, the only one in existence that has now disappeared. It was in a museum in East Germany and then the wall came down and the unification took place and the painting cannot be found anymore. But I am very fortunate not to have a black and white, or just a black and white, but a color reproduction of this painting. And it has this African, dark brown skinned man with happy to be nappy hair, good hair, right? And he's with his wife. Yeah, because I'm looking at it from my perspective. Why isn't this good hair, the little I got? And why isn't this fair skin. Why do we allow other people to define our reality for us? Dr. Wade Nobles, a brilliant psychologist in San Francisco, liked to say that the essence of power is the ability to define someone's reality and make them live according to that definition as though it is a definition of their own choosing. And that's what white people have done to us. They have defined our reality for us. So for example, I'm troubled when I look at the media and I see the standards of beauty for African-American women being projected as Beyonce and Mariah Carey. Nothing wrong with Mariah Carey and Beyonce. But should that be the sole standard of beauty for African people? And if it is, what are the implications of that? What does that mean? Does that mean as a man, I'm gonna go for the most light-skinned sister I can find with the most European features I can find? I love black folk from snow to crow and bright to night. But not everybody looks like those two women. All right. Beyonce? <laughs> I know, I know, I know. <laughs> Septimius is spelled S-E-P-T-I-M-I-U-S. And you can remember that if you think of the month of September. And he is born on April 11th, 146 AD, in a place called Leptis Magna Libya. And now Libya is opening up to tourism. And I hope that, uh, I know you told me the brother is leading a tour there. I hope to be able to go there later this year or next. He's born in 146. He's born of a very prominent family. He becomes a senator. He becomes a general. And in 193, I don't know the exact date, but in 193 AD, he becomes emperor of Rome, right? And I don't know if he's the first African emperor, but he's the most prominent. And he's in power from 193 to 211. I think that's uh, 18 years. And he's the last Roman emperor to die in bed 
for 100 years. After that, every Roman emperor for 100 years is assassinated, murdered by the Praetorian Guard, poisoned by his wife or somebody. Okay? So that's his distinction. And he is a great builder. If you go to Rome, you will see in the Imperial Forum, um, the toughest building there, it's an arch, of, a triumphant arch of Septimius Severus. And he dies in England in 211. He uh, is leading a military campaign in northern England, a city called York. Last night, I watched uh, part of this movie, Braveheart, for about the 300th time. I think I was born in Scotland in another lifetime. I, I'm into, the bagpipe is my favorite instrument. Okay? You see why I spend a lot of time by myself, right? Now, Septimius Severus goes, and, and the reason I mentioned Braveheart is because um, they have a big battle in York in northern England. York is like uh, between England and Scotland. So Septimius Severus went up there leading a Roman military campaign, and that's where he died. But before he died, he fathered two sons who succeeded him. One is named Geta, G-E-T-A, who was murdered by his brother, the more famous brother, Caracalla. And that's not the actual name, but that's what he is known as, Caracalla, C-A-R-A-C-A-L-L-A. -L -L -A. And the image of Caracalla do not, I've never seen a color painting of him, but I've seen a lot of statues of him. And he always had knotty hair, like really nappy hair. Like he would have had a hard time getting a pick through there, right? And he is always described as ugly. And apparently he was very cruel. But he is the successor of his daddy who was born in Africa. His mother is from Syria. His mother's name is Julia Domna, D-O-M-N-A. And the reason I put emphasis on Caracalla is because when we go back to Morocco on the way to Casablanca, we're going to stop in a, a Roman city called Volubilis. And in Volubilis, you have an arch, not as impressive as the one Septimius Severus had erected in Rome, but an arch of Caracalla. Because one of the things that Caracalla did is he gave Roman citizenship to many people in the provinces. And this was a big thing. With Roman citizenship, you could climb to very high positions. And so the people of Volubilis were so happy because of that that they erected an arch in honor of Caracalla. And I'll show it to you when we get there. You have, Af and then you have the last representative of the, uh, what's called the Severus D Severan dynasty. His name is Alexander Severus. Now, I know there's some discussion, I don't know if it's been confirmed, about a, a possible dessert club trip to Italy next year. And if it happens, Rome has to be the center of that. And in the National Museum, you have a, a whole room that's just devoted to the Severan dynasty. And I went in this room not knowing what was in there. In fact, I was in the museum about three, four years ago, and I walked past it, and in the corner of my eye, I said, man, that looks like some African over there. And I went in the room, and sure enough, I saw all these African statues. And the most African one of all is a man named Alexander Severus, who is the grandson of Septimius. And he dies, he's assassinated in 235 AD, and he's the last representative of this African dynasty. You have African saints. You have an African saint named uh, Tertullian. Tertullian's contribution is that he made Latin the official language of the church, of the Catholic church. You have another saint named Saint Cyprian who was beheaded and made a martyr. And St. Cyprian had such courage and such dignity that before he died, he gave the man who was going to cut his head off 25 gold pieces. And basically said, you're just doing your job. Don't worry about it. Now, I, if somebody comes to kill me, I ain't going to give him no money. But that's the way C Cyprian was. And this is like 250, a brilliant intellectual. And then you have the baddest of them all named St. Augustine who was bishop of a place called Hippo in, a, in what is now Algeria. These are all Africans. You have African popes. You have a pope named Victor I, who was responsible for Easter being celebrated on Sunday every year. Up to that point, it was a floating holiday. Victor, Victor I, Saint Victor, the first African pope. You have another one named Miltiades, who's considered the most intellectual of the popes of his time. And then you have the third African pope that I'm aware of. His name is Galatius. So these are three, G-E-L-A-S-S-I-U-S. -S -S so these are three African popes. At one time, and this is a historical fact that nobody can refute. In fact, there are books written about this. There's a book called, for example, Septimius Severus, the African Emperor of Rome by a man named Anthony Burley, B-I-R-L-E-Y. And it's, all the information is right there. It's a white man. Writes this big, fat book, 
and he calls it the African Emperor of Rome. So the information is there. At one time, you have an African Emperor, Septimius Severus, you have an African Pope, Victor I, and you have the leading theologian in the Roman world, Tertullian, all at the same time. Now imagine that. That's inconceivable today. You have an African Emperor, an African Pope, and the leading intellectual in the Roman world. They're all Africans. It was Rome who produced the African Terence Afar, the man who said, I am a man, and therefore nothing human is alien to me. That sounds like African hum humanity to me. That sounds like something a brother would say, that I am a human being, and therefore nothing human is really foreign to me. And then, as I pointed out, by the second century AD, you have one third of all the members of in Africa. So that's Rome. So we've covered Phoenicia, we've covered Rome. Briefly, Africans in the Arab world, before we get to the Moors, you have a book that we reference in this book. And this is the most important book on the subject that has ever been written, certainly in English. This book is called The Golden Age of the Moor. <coughs> and it's written by my principal teacher, a man named Ivan Van Sertima. Van Sertima is from uh, Guyana in South America. And I met Ivan for the first time in 1981. And I started working with him in 1982. And he produced about 12 volumes like this. African presence in Europe, African presence in ancient America, the uh, great African thinkers, uh, blacks in science, which everybody should have and this one right here. And I was able to work with Ivan on all of these books. In fact, my chapter in here is the first chapter in the book, and it's the longest chapter in the book. And Ivan thinks it's the best chapter in the book, okay? <laughs> I ain't gonna say anything, but that's what Ivan said, right? And um, we make mention in this book of a man named Al-Jahiz, A-L hyphen J-A-H-I-Z. And Al-Jahiz, um, don't worry, Gary, you got it. I like your enthusiasm. Restrain yourself. Um, Al-Jahiz writes a book called The Book of the Glory of the Blacks Over the Whites. Some people translated The Book of the Superiority of the Blacks Over the Whites. This is written in the ninth century. Al-Jahiz is a black man. That's not his actual name. The name Al-Jahiz means big eyes. A boat. Apparently his brother had really big eyes that were very prominent, so he had this nickname. Apparently, the Arabs were good for giving black folk nicknames. For example, the greatest musician in the world at that time, they called the Black Bird. And this brother was m remarkable. He introduced innovations in clothing, told people they should change their clothes from time to time, is credited with toothpaste and deodorant. And he was the greatest musician of his day. He was so good that when he came to a city to perform, the mayor and all the leading dignitaries of the city would come out and stand on the side of the road to greet him when he came into the city. Tough African. So you have Al-Jahiz, and Al-Jahiz is born in southern Iraq, a place called Basra, B-A-S-R-A, in the ninth century. And he's considered one of the greatest scholars of his day. He wrote 40 books or something like that on all kinds of subjects. And he lived to be about 90 years old. <clears throat> and he died, according to the story, he had a huge library. <laughs> and this reminds me of myself in some ways. And it was an earthquake, and all the books fell over on the brother's bed. And unfortunately, he was in the bed when they fell. And he died he, by his own books. Now, what a way to go. That's style. Like, if you got to go, you got to go. I wouldn't mind going like that. People go remember you like that. They might talk about you a thousand years later. I hope they talk about us a thousand years from now. And what will they say if they do? What will future generations say about you and me? Will they say there were some Africans who did everything they could to make the world a better place? Or will they say there were some trifling, be about nothing, Negroes who never did anything? And, there were, and when they died, we had a big party. Not to mourn their loss, but to say we're glad they're gone. What will they say? What will our statement in life be? This is very profound. When I go to the universities, I ask the students that, what are you here for? What is your mission in life? What is your statement in life? Well, Al Jahiz and the people I'm talking about have such a mission in life that we talk about them as though they're with us in the room now. 
Al-Tahiz perceived that racism was creeping into the Arab world, that this discrimination or hostility towards African people was becoming more pronounced. And he said, well, let me address that. And so he wrote about different things. For example, he wrote about a man named Antar, or Antara the Lion. I was going to show you a picture of him that I photographed in Syria, black, in the Medina in Damascus, very rare photograph. Um, he mentioned um, Antara. Antara is considered like a, a national hero among Arabs, particularly the Bedouin, the desert-dwelling Arabs, the nomads. And he's considered the father of chivalry, a dashing knight, a champion of women, a champion of the oppressed. And I think he has a book that he wrote about his wife, love poems called Ebla or Abla. I think it's A-B-L-A. So Al-Tahiz wrote about him. And he wrote about the lineage of the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He said that Muhammad's grandfather was the Sharif of Mecca. And he fathered 10 sons, or in Jahiz's words, 10 lords. And if you really, really want this book, it's been translated by a Moroccan, interestingly enough, about 20 years ago. And I was tight with the man who paid for the translation, and he gave me a copy of the translation of this book that's more than 1,000 years old. And if you're really interested, I'll see that you get a copy of it. Okay? Now, he wrote about um, the Sharif of Mecca. I think his name is Ilma Talib. I, I apologize if I mess up his name. Who had 10 sons and 10 lords, each of whom was black, and magnificent. One of them is Abdallah, the father of the prophet. In the early days of Islam, Muhammad is advised to send his close companions to Ethiopia. He's told, if you look to Ethiopia, sisters and brothers, there you will find a land of righteousness ruled by a king under whom no man is persecuted. It is a land where God will give you rest from all of your afflictions. And the earliest Muslims went there. And when they came back to Mecca, Muhammad was so impressed by the way they were treated in Ethiopia, in Africa, that he said that he who brings an Ethiopian man or an Ethiopian woman into his house brings the blessings of God there. Some people think that's why Ethiopia was never massively invaded by the Arabs. It's because Muhammad was so impressed by how the Muslims were received there. He said, just leave them alone. No jihad there. You have Bilal, who we talked about the other day. Bilal is the first mu'ezin, the first caller to prayer of the faithful. He had a deep, booming voice. He is so important, he's referred to as a third of the faith of Islam. I want to show you his tomb, hopefully tonight, and a mosque named in Damascus after him. Story goes, Muhammad told Bilal, this pious man, this devout man, this man of great faith, Bilal, last night, I dreamed I went to paradise, and I found that you had been there before me. Black imams, black muftis at Mecca and Medina. The first Muslim to fall in battle is an African. These things we should not forget. Because when we see history as projected to us today, it's monolithic. If you watch the movies, which determines most of our consciousness about history, we are left out for the most part. You see the movies, Kingdom of Heaven, uh, The Last Samurai. I can show you images, Black Samurai, but Tom Cruise didn't hang out with them in the movies. I, they showed the movie King Arthur. I'm going to tell you in a minute about black people at the, uh, King Arthur's court, the Knights of the Round Table. So these things are left out. And then you have, uh, so my point there is, even if you talk about an Arab incursion into Spain and Portugal, you're still talking about black people as a part of that movement. Now finally, the Moors themselves. The word Moor is derived from the word Mari or Mars. This is a Greek word, Greek and Latin, M-A-U-R-I. And the other variation is Mars, like, almost like Maurice, M-A-U-R-U-S. It means scorched. And this was a term, sisters and brothers, that was applied to the people of Northwest Africa, Northwest Africa on the other side of Egypt. And then the Arabs begin to move. Now, the first time we hear about the Moors, they're fighting with the, uh, um, the Carthaginians. They're fighting in Hannibal's army. And then when the Carthaginians are finally defeated, they fight alongside the Romans. We have evidence we show in this book, for example, and you should try to get this book. It has Wayne Chandler's work in there. It's a lot of African. It's an anthology. It has a lot of good stuff. Uh, we rep reproduce in here a, a Roman military diploma Apparently, if at a certain point, if you fought in the Roman army and you survived and you lived for, you fought in the army for 25 years, you were a veteran, you could retire with honor in many parts of the Roman Empire. And it says that some of these Moors were not, they weren't sent back to where they came from because they were well-trained, 
The Romans did not want to see an insurrection. So they would be sent to other parts of the Roman Empire. Some of these Africans were sent to places like uh, Croatia, Bosnia, Serbia, Romania. And apparently some of their descendants still live in these places 1,500 years later. It's quite a remarkable story. We are a remarkable people. And we have the greatest story that's barely been told. And we're trying to tell that story. And then you have Moors who fight, um, who, who are identified as Berbers and who fight the Arabs when they invade Africa at the end of the 7th century. And the, most, the greatest leader is a woman named Al-Kahina, who is called a princess or prophetess, and she's a black woman who leads the Moorish um, or Berber defense against Arabs in North Africa. She's eventually defeated. She tells her sons to go over to the Arab side because it's obvious they are going to win. And these people become a part of the movement that goes from North Africa into Spain. The first movement is in 710. It's led by a man named Tarif, T-A-R-I-F. Tarifa is named after him. And Tarif leads 400 Moors or Berbers to defeat these guys. And so in 711, another group is led by a man named Tariq, who is an African governor. And his commander-in-chief is a man named Musa, who is an Arab. I don't know if he's black or white. I don't know. It may not even be important in this context. But they lead 10 to 20,000, mostly Berber or Moor soldiers, and a few Arabs into Spain. And they fight and defeat um, a Visigothic army led by a man named um, Roderick in 711. You all still with me? Most of you all anyway. Now let me read this, this brief quote. I think this is good stuff. And this is a paragraph from the book. In 711, with the Berber or Moorish expeditionary force and a small number of Arab translators and propagandists, some say 300, Tariq crossed the straits and disembarked near a rocky promontory from which this day has borne his name, Gibral Tariq or Tariq's Mountain, which we call Gibraltar. In August 711, he won a decisive victory over the Visigoth army. It was during the conflict that Roderick, the last Visigoth king, was killed. On the eve of the battle, Tariq is alleged to have aroused his troops with the following words, and I quote, My brethren, or my brothers, the enemy is before you, the sea is behind you. Where would you run to? Follow your general. I am resolved either to lose my life or to trample on the prostrate king of the Romans. And they wipe the Visigoths out. The Africans won that battle, and Roderick himself was killed. And apparently soon, uh, Musa joined Tariq in Spain right after that, and they helped uh, subdue most of the Iberian Peninsula, and then the Moors began to come over. In fact, it says in the aftermath of these brilliant struggles, Berbers or Moors by the thousands flooded into the Iberian Peninsula. So eager were they to come that some of them are said to have floated over on tree trunks. They couldn't wait to get here. Uh, Tariq himself, at the conclusion of his illustrious military career, retired to the distant east we are informed to spread the teachings of Islam. This is in direct contradiction to what is happening today. Now you have Africans who are leaving Senegal, leaving Mali, can't wait to get over here. But there was a time when Africans did not come to Europe as paupers, and they didn't come just as tourists. They came and reintroduced civilization back into Europe. We should never lose sight of this. About a year ago, um, not even quite a year. There was a case of a number of Senegalese who were killed in Morocco trying to climb a fence to come to Europe. And the Moroccan army shot them down like dogs. And they later apologized for it. It didn't help those that got killed, though. And a white woman in Europe, uh, I don't know if she was Spanish or what, wrote a newspaper article about these poor, pitiful Africans who are leaving Africa because Africa is so messed up to come to Europe to search for a better life. And Thabo Mbeki, the president of South Africa, wrote a long letter, which I have a copy of, a magnificent letter, where he says it wasn't always like that. Never forget that there was a time when Africans were masters and not slaves. So 7-Eleven, and then these Africans come in, and they help really establish a magnificent civilization. They are welcomed by many people. For example, the Jews, who had been persecuted by the Visigoths. And you have seen some evidence of what those Africans did. You have magnificent cities that are developed, 
and the Europeans retreat into the northernmost parts of Spain and Portugal, and then they finally begin to push back, and this is called the Reconquista or the Reconquest. You have different dynasties. You have the Almohaded dynasty. You have the Almoravid dynasties, and these Moors are described as black, this is in English literature, black as pitch, black as a crow, black as a raven, black as ink, nothing white about them but their teeth. Shakespeare used the word Moor and Negro as synonyms. For Shakespeare, there was no difference between a Negro and a Moor. In fact, we begin the chapter in the book with this. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, the Moors as early as the Middle Ages and as late as the 17th century, quote, this is from the Ox Oxford English Dictionary, were commonly supposed to be black or very swarthy. And hence the word more is often used for Negro. Now this is the white man. And you know the European knows everything. All you got to do is quote him and you know you never go wrong. That's a joke. So anyway, you have these movements. And then in 1492, the Moors are finally defeated. Boabdil, who may have been black, I'm not sure, surrenders the keys to uh, the Alhambra to Ferdinand and Isabella. I think the exact date is January 6th. I think that's it. It's certainly January 1492. And it's downhill after that. His mother rebuked him. She said, you weep. He began to weep when he surrendered the city. And she said, you weep like a woman for a city you failed to defend like a man. Now, when your mother talks about you like that, you have reached a low point in your life. Your mother is supposed to be there for you under all circumstances. So when your mother does that, it's bad news. Now, more spread all over Europe, and I'm going to finish with this. I'm going to do two more quick comments, and I'm going to finish. What happened to these Moors? Some of them converted to Christianity, or they became, or, or certain people became identified with the Moors. For example, you have a man named St. Maurice, and I have a fantastic image of St. Maurice that I hope to show you tonight. The word Maurice is derived from Latin and means like a Moor. The black St. Maurice is regarded as the greatest patron saint of the Holy Roman Empire. He is, this is a black man, as African as you will ever see. Look like he comes from the Congo or Nigeria or Uganda, where I just left. And he is the patron saint of the Roman Empire for 300 years. You particularly find him in Germany, in Lithuania, in the Baltic states. But you also have black knights Christian converts like Sir Morian. Morian is, the, uh, is an epic story in Dutch and French and later in English of a black man who converts to Christianity and becomes a knight at King Arthur's round table. He, when we find him, he's looking for his father. Apparently his father was a, um, had come from Europe and gone to Palestine, gone to Jerusalem during the Crusades. And he met his mother and got her pregnant and then left. And so Morian grew up without a father. So when he became old enough, he began to look for his daddy. He wanted some explanations. And the biggest explanation was, why would you leave my mother? He was going to defend his mother's honor. And so much of the story is about Morian looking for his dad. That sounds like a familiar story, doesn't it? And in the process, he has all these wonderful adventures. He hangs out with Galahad, with Gawain, with Lancelot. And this, all the information is right here in the book. I have a copy of the translation from the Dutch into English. And Morian is described as a magnificent knight. In fact, one of the knights at the round table fell in love with Morian. But we won't go into that story, right? So you have Morian, who's described as black as the knight, black as ink, black as a crow, Nothing white about him but his teeth. Now, why are these stories not told in school books? How come they're not in the Philadelphia schools, in the Brooklyn schools, in the Detroit schools? You know the answer. Designed to keep African people with a sense we didn't do anything. And a lot of our behavior is a reflection of, a, of the fact that our history has been so distorted. And so many of us emulate other people's behavior. That's why I got upset yesterday in the cathedral with all this emphasis on Columbus, Isabella, they are not heroes for us. They may be heroes for other Europeans, not for us. George Washington can never be a hero of mine because George Washington owned more than 100 Africans. 
How can Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin and Madison and Ro how can they be our heroes? These are slave owners. We have to be able to define for ourselves uh, what we're going to do now for the course of the next 45 minutes or an hour uh, is just to visually illustrate the lecture that I gave this morning through the hard work of Gary and Hassan and Bob and Ali and a few other folk, we were able to get a slide projector and a screen. Not a simple thing. It may seem very simple, but much of this technology is, through many circles, obsolete. So these are not the easiest machines to get. Uh, we hope that you will find it worthwhile. We want you to get everything you paid for on this trip and more, and I think so far that has been the case. Now, I think Gary gave us the expression earlier that has been oft repeated, the old cliche that seeing is believing. I think that was it. The other one is a picture is worth a thousand words. I mentioned earlier that it's the common perception of, uh, for African people, African Americans, African descendant people, uh, whatever term we're going to use, that this is where our history begins. This is the door of no return. This is where the Africans were taken before they were put on the floating coffins that we sometimes call slave ships. Before this uh, actual, before they were taken out of this, the dehumanizing process had already begun to take place. Africans were captured in the interior of Africa, chained, shackled, and marched to coastal dungeons. And from what people in Ghana have told me, I've been fortunate enough to go to Ghana twice, I'll be back there again in about a month, is that most of the Africans who died as a result of enslavement died in Africa from the time they were captured and traumatized and marched to those dungeons. And the dungeons themselves, as we all know, were horrible experiences. How many of you have been in West Africa? Okay, a good portion. Well, you've been in many of these places. You've seen the women's dungeon, which really angers me to think about it, how the women were separated and systematically raped. Uh, I went in the women's dungeon in Cape Coast. I couldn't even go in Elmina, but I went in Cape Coast and I saw that and that's what I remember the most. In these dark, putrid rooms where our ancestors were kept, uh, chained together like animals, because that's the way they were treated, branded with hot irons. And then when there were enough of them to make a voyage profitable, they would be taken out of the door of no return. And they become commodities and merchandise and property, less than human. Um, I've, I'm always struck, too, by the fact that in all of these that I've been to, I think I've been to four, three or four, including uh, Wida in Benin, there's always a church right in the middle of the dungeon. Uh, these Africans didn't want to go. They went kicking and screaming. And in many cases, we are told that they put dirt in their mouths to take Africa with them. We were taken from Africa, but we took... Africa with us. And we say you're, we're not African because we're born in Africa. We say we're African because Africa is born in us, whether we like it or not. So we might as well get comfortable with it because not, it's not going to go away. And those Africans were taken to Trinidad and Jamaica and Virginia and Haiti and the Dominican Republic and Brazil and even Canada in some cases, all throughout the Western Hemisphere. But our history doesn't start there, and it doesn't start here. This is in Suriname in South America. This is actually um, reproduced in a museum in Curacao in the Caribbean. And the idea was uh, to create examples, to create fear, to prevent rebellion, to prevent insurrection. Sometimes they would take a strong African man and then make all the other Africans bear witness and maybe take a knife, tie him up and cut him from his throat to his groin tearing out his heart, his liver, his intestines, chopping them into little pieces, and making the other enslaved Africans eat a piece. Remember, I used the word enslaved as opposed to slaves. Slaves didn't come from Africa. Africans were taken from Africa and enslaved. And it's not just a matter of semantics or linguistics. It makes a profound difference in terms of how we perceive ourselves and how the world perceives us. And then you have a process, at least in South America, this again is in Suriname, a Dutch colony of South America. Now, I think most of us, when we think of South America and African people, we think of Brazil for the most part, a Portuguese country. But there are tens of millions of Africans in Venezuela, in Bolivia, in Peru, in Colombia, uh, in Ecuador. 
in Paraguay and Uruguay and even Argentina. Do you know it was in the slums of Argentina that African people invented the now famous dance called the tango? So Africans are taken to all of these places. But this is in Suriname, and this is a process called assing or arsing. Uh, A-R-S-I-N-G. I guess it's just the way the Dutch would have spelled it. And the idea was to humiliate and to instill fear. And so they would take a woman and tie her up, humiliate her, strip her in front of all these African people, and then fill her body with gunpowder and blow her up in front of nursing mothers in many cases. This is our legacy, too. Not all of our history is about building those pyramids on the Giza Plateau. And these are things the Jews say never forget. I say always remember so that it does not happen again. But again, our history doesn't begin there. Our history begins more like this right here. This is an image of an African goddess in Europe. This is 30,000 years old. It's four inches high. It's made of soapstone. I've actually seen the piece personally. This is uh, in the Natural History Museum in Vienna, Austria. Vienna is a very interesting place. Lots of museums. In fact, in one day in Vienna, two years ago, I visited eight museums. I walked, as a matter of fact, in most of these places. You would have been proud, okay? <laughs> this is regarded as the oldest human figurine in Europe. And we can compare that with the hair and the hips to these African women in Southern Africa right now. These are the Nama. I hope that doesn't embarrass you. But I was with a groups of Africans just like this in South Africa and Namibia about a month ago. And remember now, I've now been in 11 countries in the last six weeks. I've been in the United States, obviously, in Southern Africa and East Africa and Central Africa. Northwest Africa, now Spain, and also France. And I'm in the middle of a 16-country tour that will be completed, God willing, in the first week of September. And it was Africans like these that represent the first human beings on the planet that wandered into Europe. So even when we're talking about the Moors, let us not forget that there are migrations and movements of African people that precede the Moors into Europe by 30,000 years. The first people in Europe are African people. African people are the aboriginal people on the planet. Humanity begins in Africa. Let us not forget that. And civilization begins in Africa, and then that is spread all over the world. It doesn't start with enslavement. It doesn't start with colonization. And then there's another movement, too, that we have not really talked about. I say that history is the movements of people. And if you want to understand how and why African people are scattered in the far corners of the earth, you have to understand these migrations. First, humanity is born in Africa. These Africans are the first people, obviously, to domesticate fire, to build a house, to wear shoes, to chart the stars in the heavens, to practice religion, spirituality, to play music, to count, to bury the dead, on and on and on. I think I mentioned to you the other day that I actually went to a place in Swaziland in southern Africa about a month ago called the Lion's Ca Cavern, the Lion's Cavern. And this is where the first mining in the world took place. 43,000 years ago, African people called San, S-A-N, you may call them Bushmen, were actually mining for iron ore and a cosmetic called hematite. Now, then you have the role of African people in classical civilization all over the world. Then you have the enslavement period, and Africans are taken into Asia, into, um, you know, because there's the Indian Ocean slave trade too just like you have a transatlantic, and then Africans are also taken out of North Africa into Western Asia. But you have a fourth migration that in many ways is more tragic than even the first three, at least the enslavement part. And these are Africans in the last 30, 40 years who are leaving Africa, going to other parts of the world in search of what they perceive as a better way of life. I've been very blessed to travel probably more than most people ever will. And I go to a lot of places that a lot of African people don't even think about going. I've been in the last year in places like Bangkok and Istanbul and Athens and Damascus and Perth and Melbourne and lots of places. And I always find my new quantities of African people in Madrid and Granada and Sevilla, et cetera. These are Africans who have left Africa because of the impoverishment of African people. That's a, a great tragedy. Africa is the wealthiest continent in the world. 
Peter Tosh, our brother from Jamaica, used to say, Africa is the richest place with the poorest race. Oh my, oh my, what a disgrace. Africans go into Senegal, from Senegal and Mali, they go through Morocco if they can, and they try to come here in Malta, in France. And that's something that we haven't talked about. Because if you look around parts of Spain, you will find small groups of Senegalese here in particular, who are more or less like refugees, paupers. And so that's something that perhaps can be discussed at another time. Now, these are Canaanites. And the Phoenicians are a coastal branch, a coastal branch of the Canaanites. Remember, Canaan land is in, um, in the coastal periphery of Lebanon. Lebanon is in Southwest Asia, what a lot of people call the Middle East, and what some of my Hebrew Israelite friends like to call Northeast Africa. And this is a depiction of a Canaanite king and queen with an Egyptian, with an African doctor. This is about 3,000 years old. I do not recall the origins of this photo. This is not one that I took myself. One of my best friends of all time, a research associate, named James E. Brunson, who is now uh, at the University of Chicago, uh, Dr. Brunson, gave me this picture more than 20 years ago. But this is from Canaan. These are people akin to the Phoenicians, who we've talked about many times. And you see the black doctor. If it was dark, it would, be, it would look better. But you see the black doctor right there, who looks like Imhotep. You all know Imhotep, the father of medicine. But do you know Imhotep was also a scribe? He was a writer. And he was so renowned as a writer that later generations of Egyptian writers, before they would write something, they would spill a little bit of ink on the ground. They would have a libation ceremony in honor of Imhotep. 2,000 years after this brother died, and they would ask themselves the question, could there be another like Imhotep? Now that's a legacy. Time has not diminished the glory of the deeds of these ancient Africans. They had a sense of mission and purpose in life that is admirable. And again, you see the, the black man on the throne and his wife and companion behind him because after all, what good is a king without a queen? This is Hannibal Barca, or Barca, B-A-R-C-A, at least that's who we believe this is. This comes from a book called uh, The Image of the Af I think it's, I believe it's The Image of the African in Western Art. This is a three volume book published by Mental Foundation in Pittsburgh and Houston in the uh, 1970s. Uh, these folk had a lot of money. They were philanthropists and they, had, philanthropists, and they had a strong interest in African art. So they put together these big, expensive art books with all these African images. And unfortunately, at that time, I really was a starving scholar. I was a student at UCLA, and I couldn't afford those books. But what I would do is go and Xerox them, and this is the best I came up with. This is a coin depicting the African general Hannibal Barca. You can even see the African elephant down below. And this is approximately 2,200 years old. Uh, these are Jews. Since we talked about Canaan land, the Jews are always associated with that area. Uh, this is from the British Museum in London. And there's about six of these, and they're all about the size of the image that you see on the screen. These are uh, Jews or Judeans from a place called Lachish. This is in the 8th century BC. These are Jewish prisoners of war captured by the people called the Assyrians. Now, the Egyptians and the Ethiopians, or Cushites, went to, e to Jerusalem to help rescue these people. And there could have been an ethnic um, relationship. Another friend of mine, a brother named Carl Franklin, who is a film director, has been trying to secure some money to do a film starring Will Smith called The Last Pharaoh that talks about the movement of Africans from the Nile Valley to go to Jerusalem to save these people. And there's a very good book written about it called The Rescue of Jerusalem. You can go and find that document. This is Ishmael. Ishmael is a traditional ancestor of the Arabs. This is a depiction of Ishmael from near Medina. Ishmael is the son of Ibrahim or Abraham. He has a black mother named Hagar, an Egyptian woman, and this is a very important piece. Again, he is considered a traditional ancestor of the Arabs. Now, we've heard a lot in the last 24 hours or so, a little longer than that, about the Syrians. 
And we saw the mural from uh, at the Alhambra that supposedly was of Syrian origin or people from Syria, but this is a black man in Syria too. What I'm trying to do is just show you that Africans permeated all of these parts of the world that had a direct relationship on more Spain. This is a Syrian nobleman. And this is a small bust, it's about this big. I saw it for the first time in the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles about 20 years ago. But I mentioned to you, I went to Syria. When did I go? Was it in November? Yeah, I think it was November last year. And I actually saw the artifact in the museum. It's just stuck down in a corner in a glass case. And I knew it was in there, and I was determined, like Sherlock Holmes with a magnifying glass, not to leave that museum until I found it. And I was very fortunate. A black man in Syria 2,000 years ago. Not a slave now. And we're going to talk about slavery a little more in a moment. This is Antar, or Antar the Lion, considered a dashing knight, a poet, an epic figure. And this is taken in the Medina in Damascus, Syria as well. I've been very blessed. I count my blessings every day. And the thing that gives me the most pleasure is to go to these parts of the world quite often by myself without having done a whole lot of advanced planning and do some research and find these pieces. These are very rare photographs. And this is the tomb of Bilal. You know, Idris on the first day, Idris, Idris, uh, took us to the Hassan II Mosque, right, in Casablanca. And he talked about the minaret, this magnificent building with the minaret where the muezzin would go and call the faithful to prayer. Well, the first caller to prayer, the first muezzin, is a black man from Ethiopia named uh, Bilal. And again, B-I-L-A-L, -L, Bilal. And um, he is a close companion to the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And I was able to find his tomb. And this is it. He's buried right there. And not only does he have a tomb in Damascus, but you have this mosque with a different kind of minaret. And the muezzin, correct me if I'm wrong, brother, will climb up there and call the faithful to prayer. You may have heard that in Morocco. It's, something, it's a very beautiful sound. Anyway, all these are from Syria. And this supposedly is a South Arabian temple guard. Now, this was given to me, this photograph, by a, a buddy of mine named Wayne Chandler, who you may know. And uh, Wayne has a chapter in this wonderful book, The Golden Age of the Moor. But Wayne is not an art historian. He calls himself an anthrophotojournalist. And sometimes I have to go back and verify what Wayne said. Because sometimes, don't tell him this. Well, you can tell him. He'll laugh. He's a good nature. He kind of plays a little loose with some of the facts, and I'm trying not to do that. Now, when Hassan and I were here in April at the Alhambra, we went in a bookstore, which you pass by when you went in the circular building, and there's a book I paid, I think, 50 euros for, and it has this exact painting. And actually, he's referred to as a Nubian temple guard, and this is a painting done by a fellow named Ludwig Deutsch, Ludwig Deutsch in uh, the 1890s. But this is a magnificent piece, is it not? beautiful piece of art. And what I'm showing you is not only elements of African history, but beautiful art that we should be able to appreciate on its own merit. The, what, what temple? Say, a temple guard. Temple yeah, it's just a, a painting. It's not an actual portrait. Oh, okay. It's not a historical piece. But when I think of the Moors in antiquity, this is the image that I think of right here. He certainly fits the description. He's got a, looks like a, a pistol. He's got a, a dagger. I don't know what that is he's holding in his hand, but it looks like he could hit you in the head with it. And I know the ladies like this picture. Usually when I show this, especially if it's dark, I hear people say, ooh. <laughs> and fortunately, it comes from the women most of the time. Now, what about Africans in the Arab world today? This, for example, who looks a bit like Alsh, uh, Alton Maddox in New York City. Other people say he looks more like Bernie Mac. Some people have suggested he looks like me. If I were to wrap that around my head, I'm not sure. But this, no? Okay, Amelia, take your word for it. We'll stick with Bernie Mac and Al, Sh and Al Maddox. And uh, from Saudi Arabia. And these photographs are taken from a book by another brother who I became good friends with, a man named Tariq Al Mansour, a big time attorney in the United States, an African American who works for OPEC, or at least he did at the time. 
and I got this one from his book too, a beautiful piece. And I love black and white photography. And uh, when it's not mine, I give credit to the source. This was the Minister of Finance in Saudi Arabia in 1954, the same year I was born. Very nice piece. And when you think of this, you might even think of Prince Bandar. You remember Prince Bandar? You used to see him on TV. I think he was a Saudi ambassador to the UN or to the United States hmm? for 30 years. This is, uh, he was the crown prince of Kuwait, and then he became, for a very short time, the emir of Kuwait. This is a member of the Al Sabah family in Kuwait. Now, I've done presentations, and Kuwaitis have come, and some of the Kuwaitis who came to my presentation look like this. And they say a great many people in Kuwait look like that. I'm kind of want to go to Kuwait, but I'm told there's really nothing to do there. But I think if I just saw these folk, that would be worth the trip. Now, I don't know if they consider themselves black. I don't know if they consider themselves African. We had a lot of discussions about that in Morocco. But I know if he had lived in Montgomery, Alabama prior to 1955, <laughs> and he had relied on public transportation, <laughs> it would have been very clear who he was. Right? We have to put these things in a context. From Iraq, an African Iraqi police officer I would say that in Iraq today, you have an African population of about 10%. And many of them live in the southern portions of Iraq, near a place called Basra. You remember I talked about Al Jahiz this morning. He was born in Basra, B-A-S-R-A. -A. Now, Africans have been in Iraq for a very long time, since Iraq is topical. Let me spend a moment with that. Um, you have a civilization in ancient Iraq called the Sumerian civilization, S-U-M-E-R-I-A-N, the Sumerians who are called the black-headed people. And, you know, I have argued in my own books that have been published that there was an African elite that governed the Sumerians. But you also have Africans taken to this part of the world as enslaved people over a thousand years ago. And they engaged in three massive insurrections, the largest of which was from 868 to 883. It is called the Revolt of the Blacks or the Revolt of the Zan, Z-A-N-J. And the Zanj, you can find that name today in Zanzibar, the root. And these Africans were treated very brutally, and they engaged in these massive insurrections, and some of them were never defeated. And I think that this brother is the descendant of those Africans who um, were taken there from East Africa and enslaved. And they're still there. You have Africans in Iran. You have Africans in Pakistan. You have Africans in all the Gulf countries. Iraq is not in Africa. Egypt is in Africa, even though people will claim that the ancient Egyptians were not African people but it's still in Africa. So I think that a more pleasant alternative is to say that the cradle of civilization is somehow out of Africa, even though the evidence does not really support that. But that's a very, very good point you make. People say that civilization began in the Fertile Crescent. When we talk about civilization, we're talking about something with four component parts, classical civilization. One, urbanization. People live in cities, towns, and villages. That's called urbanization. They're no longer essentially nomadic. They settle down. Number two, and it doesn't happen to go in this, doesn't have to be in this particular order, people have agricultural science. They're able to farm. They can feed themselves, and therefore, they can sustain large populations. Number three, you have writing systems or scripts. In the Nile Valley, we call it the metu nature. That means the sacred speech or divine speech or the common term is hieroglyphs or hieroglyphics. In uh, the Tigris-Euphrates River Valley, it's called cuneiform. In the Indus River Valley, it's called the Harappan script. South of Egypt, it's called the Meroitic script because, again, Egypt should not be looked at as an isolated entity. We should talk more properly about Nile Valley civilization, of which Egypt was probably the most refined part. Now, civilizations themselves tend to develop along the banks of rivers because rivers, by their very nature, facilitate civilization. Because with rivers, you have transportation. Because you can get up on the, you can sail up and down on the river. You have irrigation. And if, because you have transportation and people are able to move around, you have communication. And so the earliest civilizations develop along the banks of rivers. And the most important one is Nile Valley civilization. So here's an African Iraqi police officer. He is not in Detroit. Andrew, you don't have to worry. He ain't in Philly. He ain't in Brooklyn, he ain't in the Bronx. But he could be. Now you will see people in the course of this presentation that look like a lot of folk you know. You may have done that already. From Palestine. 
I understand we got some folks who say they went to Howard University. This woman went to Howard University. She was a law student. She's an African Palestinian. I, ha I moderate an e-group. I moderate three e-groups. One is called Travel with Renoco, which I invite you to give me your email address. Anybody can be in it. It's free. Uh, and you find out what I'm doing, where I'm going. We promoted uh, some of the dessert club trips in that e-group. Another one called Building African Libraries. One of the things I'm trying to do is build an African library in Accra, Ghana. I lectured in Accra for the second time in 2004, and a little kid came up uh, in the lecture in a conference, this little boy, and he, asked, he raised his hand. I said, yes. He said, can you come and teach at my school? Oh, this is about a six-year-old kid. And I was you know, kind of stunned. And I said, well, I have to talk to your parents. Now, after that, I went to Benin and Togo, and I said, well, look, if your parents can make the arrangements, I'd be happy to come and at least give a lecture at your school. And I did. And it was very primitive in, this, in that sense. No air conditioning, not too much of anything. And I fell in love with these kids. These very precocious, very disciplined, quiet, asking me all kind of questions. And then the schoolmaster came. And I said, now what can I do to make a difference here? So he took me around the campus. He took me into the library. They had a few copies of Dick and Jane ran up the hill. And they didn't look like this, I assure you. And he says, I said, what do you need? He said, we need a library. And so I pledged to work with some other people to put books in that library. Now, two years later, we've collected about 1,400 books, textbooks, encyclopedias, Chancellor Williams, Naeem Akbar, Jawanda Kanjufa, you name it. The problem is sending it over there. We've accumulated about $2,000, but shipping stuff to Africa, as you know, is no joke. And so if you want to be a part of that, you can. But the other e-group is called the Global African Presence. And we had an African-Palestinian in that group. That's fascinating to me. When I go to Morocco and see these African people, and when you all leave, I'm going into the south, Marrakesh. I'm excited about that. When I go into Tunisia, see African people, they're excited about that. When you go to Egypt today, you go deep in the south, in Nubia, African population centers. And it would appear that all over North Africa, uh, I would imagine it's the same in Libya and Algeria, the Africans seem to be pushed in the south. And that's a discussion that we can have at some point. Anyway, this is an African-Palestinian law student formerly at Howard University. She got kicked out. And the Israelis said that she, the Israelis said that she was involved in terrorist activities. And in Jordan, well, we get to Jordan in a minute. We'll preempt the story. Uh, not very clear. Uh, we can blame Bob for that. This is an African woman in Yemen. Another place I was planning to go just before 911. I was when, just before 911 took place, I had gone to Vietnam and Burma and northern Thailand. And I didn't hardly see any black folk over there. I spent a lot of time by myself. And it was much hotter than it is here. So a lot of times I would go out in the morning, see the temples, and then I'd be by myself in my hotel room for the better part of the day, taking notes. And I remember one afternoon writing down all the places that I was going to go over the next two or three years. And on the list was Yemen and Pakistan in particular. And so when the World Trade Center bombing went down, that took Yemen and Pakistan off the table. Anyway, this is an image of a young African woman in Yemen. Uh, Yemen is important because this is probably part of the domain of the famous Queen of Sheba. Now, I assume you recognize the very handsome but rather short man in this image right here. <laughs> this is about two years ago, a year and a half ago. Yes, take a picture, Hassan. Thank you very much. <laughs> in Jordan, and this brother's name is Raja Juma. Now, when I go to these places, I tell the travel agent, the tour guide, I, they say, what are you doing here, sir? What would you like to do? Because they want to make you happy. It's business. I, I want to meet some Africans. And in Jordan, I struck pay dirt. I had a guy say, well, one of my best friends is an African. And I said, well, I'd like to meet your best friend. And so this is Raja Juma, who is the assistant food and beverage director at the Move and Pick Hotel at the Dead Sea Resort in um, northern Jordan. And we spent a half of an afternoon together. He treated me like royalty, treated me like Hassan does. Nothing was too good for me. And he says, I've never faced racism outside of Jordan. Now, I always read that in these parts of the world, African people really had it tough. But when I talk to them, they tell me something very different. I talk to black folk in Tunisia, in Morocco, in Jordan, and they say, no, no, it's not like that. They say, everybody's the same here. 
The black people tell me that. The white folks tell me that. But in the West, we have a very different impression. So I listened to Raj all day. He said his grandfather was born in South Africa, and his father was born in Palestine, and he was born in Jordan, and he, you know, occupies a very high position. He told me about all the people he had met. He told me Colin Powell had come there at this resort, and he said Colin Powell was really cool. And he said the other person was really, really cool was Bill Clinton. He said Bill Clinton gave him a $1,000 tip, your tax, tax dollars, okay? <laughs> And that made him really cool. He went and showed me all of these pictures and gave me his card and said we were going to connect. He says, Renofo, I've only faced racism one place. I said, where? He says, in Miami. He said he went to the United States twice, and he says Miami is the only place he's ever been called a nigger. In Miami, not Jordan. Jordan, I saw Africans all over the place, and I had a wonderful time, and that's why I'm taking a group there, hopefully in November. I mean October. Now, this is a black Bedouin child uh, in Jordan also. And I don't know if he would think of himself as black or not. This is how I met him. I'm in a place called Petra, considered one of the wonders of the world. And I, Petra is a huge place. Now I had a walk from my hotel. You thought yesterday was an ordeal. I walked from my hotel to the entrance. That took about an hour and a half right there. Straight walk, flat. And you go through this gorge, and then you enter into this area called Petra, an ancient cemetery mausoleum combined into one, and it's huge. And everybody kept saying, <coughs> excuse me, sir, what you need to see is the monastery. And I said, where is that? It's, it's over there on that hill. So I walked about another three or four miles, still in pretty good shape. No, I don't look like it, but I was humping, and I got there. And people just said, do you want to ride a camel? I said, no. You want to ride a donkey? You want to ride a mule? No. I can handle it. So I get up there, and I said, well, how many steps is to the monastery? They said, about 1,000. I said, that ain't too bad. I walked about 10 steps, and I said, well, maybe. <laughs> and so I saw this black kid, and I like to recycle black dollars, as you know. And he says, sir, or something that effect, I'll take you up there. So we agreed on a price, I think 10 Jordanian dinars. And I rode on this little white donkey, which is about this high. It was one of the worst decisions I ever made in my life. The donkey swayed to and fro. We walked, we got to the edge of the cliff, and I was praying. You know, you'd be surprised how religious you can get under certain circumstances. And I would look over, and then I would lean back this way. And I wanted to get off the donkey, but I was afraid if I got off, just the movement was going to cause me to go over to that cliff. Somebody said that I looked just like his father. That kid was mad. He said, no. And I don't think it was a personal thing. I think his idea that his father would be a black man like me was something that he was not prepared to contemplate. Maybe I'm misreading it, but we have a tendency to do that. We are products of our environment, are we not? And it's very difficult to divorce ourselves from the environment that we grew up in. And America is such a racist, polarized society that we bring those attitudes with us all over the world. And sometimes it doesn't necessarily correspond. Anyway, I got to the monastery, and it was a... Uh, it was worth it, but I walked back down. <laughs> but when I got to the bottom, I would have taken a camel, a mule, a cockroach. If they had said, <laughs> it'll give me, I mean, my legs were like rubber. I couldn't make it. Anyway, that's Jordan. I shouldn't tell you that because I want some of y'all to go on the trip. Where was, where was that? Where Petra. Okay. Now, here's an interesting piece right here. We talk about Africans. We talk about slavery. This is a photograph, a painting that I saw for the first time in the National Gallery in Edinburgh, Scotland, of all places. I always wanted to go to Scotland. I was telling you about Braveheart this morning and Rob Roy. I'd be identifying with Mel Gibson on the horse and all the stuff painted on his face. I said, oh, I must have been there in a previous lifetime. So I went there about two years ago, and I had a great time. Edinburgh is a really nice city. Lots of South Africans there, interestingly enough. And I saw this piece. This is a slave auction in Cairo. One um, caption says it was, is this is in the 13th century. Another one says it's much later than that. Now, let, what do you have here? You see white women being sold into slavery. You see a white man buying the slaves and an African who was the auctioneer. Now, that's a very different perspective on history. What am I trying to say here? That slavery, when we think of it, we should not just think of African people. All people have been enslaved at one time or another. The word slave is rooted in the word slob, not Africa. 
this is an interesting one. I got that. I finally found the photograph itself because they wouldn't let me take a picture in the museum. I couldn't bribe the Scots like I could the Egyptians. Uh, they didn't, you know, I pulled out a five and they said, sir, there's no photography allowed. Right? They put the camera up if you want to keep it. I said, all right. But I found it in a book in Istanbul. I think it was Istanbul, somewhere in Turkey. And this is from the Tokapi Palace in Istanbul. Now I'm showing you images now of the African presence in the Muslim world or Islamic world. What is it accurate to say? Islamic world or Muslim world? Islamic world. This is in the Ottoman Empire in Turkey. There's the Ottoman Sultan, and you can see those black figures on top there. This is one of the chiefs of the black eunuchs. In the Ottoman Empire, they would castrate young boys, black and white. And it is said that 80% of these boys would die as a result. They would bleed to death. And then for whatever reason, um, they would be segregated. And the black eunuchs became much more powerful than the white eunuchs. And the chief of the black eunuchs became the fourth most powerful person in the Ottoman Empire. He's the only person that had access to the Sultan 24-7. And it is said when they retired, they lived a golden existence in Cairo. So these are all African Muslims during the same time as Moorish Spain. An African Muslim in India, a CD Lord. And that's a specialty of mine. I'm supposed to be, I've been called at least, the world's leading authority on the African presence in Asia. I have three books on the subject now, actually four, including one that's just come out in French called 100,000 Year History of the African Presence in Asia, my first foreign language book. And this is one of the photos that we use in the book. It's not like CD. It's spelled S-I-D-D-I-S, -D -D -I -I CDs. These people remember Africa, and they say we would go back if they could. I've done interviews with them or seen interviews, and they have a clear consciousness of their African identity. And by the way, Pakistan, they're called Shidis. In India, they're called CDs, and in Sri, uh, Sri Lanka, they're called Kafirs. But it's the same group, and they represent Africans who were enslaved, converted to Islam, and won their freedom. The head of the Cedis was known as the Admiral of the Indian Ocean during Mughal times. The Mughals are kind of the cousins of the Mongols. And they received an annual stipend of 300,000 rupees every year. So they were well treated and they were warriors. And they would guard the ships of Muslim pilgrims going from India to Mecca and Medina. Because otherwise, pirates would molest those ships. And even Batuta, who was from Morocco, from Tangier, by the way, where we'll be going tomorrow, said he went to India, he's a great traveler in the 14th century, and he said in his own works, if one CD was on the ship and word got out, no pirate will come near that ship. And their communities can still be found scattered over India right now and Pakistan as well. Mansa Musa, Sultan of the mighty Mali Empire in medieval Africa, an African Muslim at the same time as Moorish Spain. He went on the Hajj to Mecca, and he apparently distributed so much gold that the worth of gold was devalued for a long time. This is Mali. Mali we know about from the fabled city of Timbuktu. A black woman in Mali today, African Muslim, an African woman in Niger today, an African Muslim. Before we get to the Moors, let me just show you one more quick chapter from ancient Rome. We talked about Rome. This is an African in ancient Rome. This is my own photograph. This is in the Antiquities Museum in Berlin. This is supposed to be in there, but it's not. This is the best image I've seen so far of Septimius Severus, the powerful African emperor of Rome. There he is, the brown-skinned black man there, um, born in Leptis Magnus, Libya, April 11th, I think, 146 AD. There's his Syrian wife, Julia Domna, and there are his two sons, Caracalla and Geta. Car Get Geta's face has been wiped out, and his brother Caracalla is responsible for that. Well, they had these divisions within the family. Only one person was going to be the emperor, and Caracalla wasn't putting it up for a vote. Okay? So simple mathematics, you know, one minus two equals one. I guess that's the way it works. I never was good in math. I was good in history. This is um, the arch of Septimius Severus in the imperial form of Rome, the most uh, splendid structure in the imperial form. And when you go to Volubilis, 
you will see a smaller arch uh, after his son Caracalla, who you will see right here. And the arch was commemorated to Caracalla because he gave Roman citizenship to the people in that part of Morocco. And you look at the curly hair. You can see the African imprint is there. His father may not have had the best choice in women, but the African imprint is there. I know his father is born in Africa. And his father is always described as an African. He's described as black in Roman literature. And so I suppose the hair that you see here on the face and the beard is a part of that African character. That looks like a brother to me. Mm -hmm. But I'll let you be the judge. This is one of the African popes. This is Saint Miltiades. He's the second. Saint Victor is the first. Miltiades is the second one. This is taken from the works of a esteemed African ancestor named Dr. Edward Scobie from Dominica. This is an African from Imperial Rome. And this is, this is in my book, by the way. It's another plug for my book, which is not too late to buy. That photograph is in there. Now, this is a very interesting piece right here. I, was, I spoke at a big conference, in, well, not such a big conference, a small conference that was supposed to be big in Berlin in October. And I said, OK, I'll go. I was in Paris anyway, and I wanted to go back to Berlin because Berlin has magnificent museums, and I'm a museum fanatic. First thing I usually do when I go anywhere is go to the museum. And so this is from a place called uh, Naples. This is in the Archaeological Museum in Naples in um, southern Italy. And I had seen it in books before, but they had a special exhibit. This artifact was on loan at a place called the Pergamon Museum in Berlin. That's Hercules. This is like 2,000 years old. This is Hercules. And this is from a villa, or via, I don't know which it is, in Naples. And it survived. And it's in the museum. That's the point. Hercules goes back to the Phoenician god Nelson. Exactly. And we talked about the pillars or columns of Hercules the other day, which is another term that uh, Gibraltar and the other rock uh, we, we, we talked about uh, were represented. Anyway, this is called Hercules in Search of His Son. So I had seen it in books, but I actually saw the painting right in front of me, and it's huge. So anyway, there's a lot of strange things going on here. <laughs> if you look close, there's a lot of strange things, but all I wanted to know was that Hercules was a brother, okay? And the ladies <laughs> like this too, but well, we don't want to dwell on Hercules, but, but I know y'all are looking. And if you ain't said it, you, I know what you, because I know how black people think, see. Now, I, I, found it, I found another photo. You can see it one more time. Buy the video. I know you're going to buy the CD now. And you can watch it late at night. You can borrow Helen's laptop and put it in there. Now, I saw this in a book when I was leaving Leonardo da Vinci Airport in uh, January this year, coming back from Lebanon, I had to fly back to Paris, and I got a really cheap ticket. I had to, in order to get to Lebanon, I had to fly through Milano, and then Rome, and then Beirut, and coming back the same way. Even the people in the airlines were saying, sir, who booked this ticket? I was trying to save some money. I, most of this, a lot of this I financed on my own. So I'm in the Roman airport, Leonardo da Vinci airport, killing time, waiting for my flight, and I was thumbing through a book, and I saw that. But the book was in German. And I wanted an English version so I could get more information about the painting. So somebody said, well, it may be a copy over here, it may be a copy over there. I got a plane to catch. But I'm running all over the airport with this little cart and all my luggage on there. I'm surprised the police didn't stop me. I'm rushing through the airport, sweating and stuff, looking for this book. And I never found the book. But just before I gave up, I found this postcard. This is St. Peter. Now, you explain it. I'm not saying St. Peter was black. But I'm seeing there's a postcard up there with St. Peter. All right, let's leave Rome. This is uh, the African goddess Aset. And I mentioned that uh, the African name is more important than the Greek name. The Greek name is Isis. The name Aset means the throne, and I like that. The idea of a woman being associated with the throne is very symbolic to me. And there's her son. The Greek name is Horus. The African name is Heru. It's where we get the word hero from. And she is the wife, and this is the son of this man. His African name is Asar. The Greek name is Osiris. And this is a very ancient creation story that involves Im Immaculate Conception, 
resurrected Savior. When you go to Egypt, you see this. Of course, a lot of you all have been there, so I don't have to go into detail. I just wanted to show this because we spent all that time in the cathedral yesterday. Ashok Kwesi would spend about three hours just on this right here, dealing with the symbol of the crown, of the crook and the flail, all the symbology, and it's worth it every second. Ashra is a brilliant scholar, okay? Now, let's just quickly show you these black Madonnas. This one is from Russia. This one is from Switzerland. Now, we are told that these, this is the one I showed you all in the, Paris last year. Remember the black virgin of Paris? People would say, but Renoko, they really don't look black. But what do black people look like? Look around the room. Go to a place like Ethiopia. Better yet, go to Brooklyn and see what black people look like. Better yet, come in this room. So there's a range. And then people would say, it's not really black. But what happened was the people who worshipped these used a lot of incense and candles, and over the centuries, the dirt and the soot got on it and made it look black. Other people would say, yeah, except the eyes and the clothes, right? Other people would say, well, it's not, and this is what I was told in Moscow, um, that it's not, sir, it's not black. I'm going to show you the one I showed in a minute. They said what happened was the people who painted it used bad paint, and it turned black. I'd like to know what that paint, what that soot has to do with that frizzy hair on the little yeah. infant Jesus' head. Now, it may be blonde, but it's frizzy. That ain't no paint. If you paint something and it's bad paint, if you're a good painter, you'd repaint it, wouldn't you? And if you worship something, if it was really important, you'd clean it off. But we must confess that sometimes blackness is ethnic and sometimes it's symbolic and sometimes it's both. She's holding in her hand the national symbol of France and it's just a magnificent piece. I enjoyed that shrine very much. This is from Montserrat, north of Barcelona. This isn't the most African one they've got. They got some others they've taken off this plate. This is the more modern looking one. And when you get real close, it's only about this big. It's way at the top of this church that pilgrims come from all over northern Spain to come and pray, especially women who want to have children who have difficulty conceiving. And you can read the prayers they write there or people who left their crutches and canes and braces who could walk after they went to this place. When you get really close, if you look at the, it's wood, it's painted black, you can look at the feet and the hands and it's brown because people have kissed the feet and kissed the hands and now it's not black anymore. These are considered miracle workers and the miracle working power is derived from their blackness. Here's somebody you know. There's the Madonna and there's the last Pope. And I would imagine if we went to Poland, we'd see his favorite Madonna, Chichester Choba, and of course, I understand there are some of these in the Vatican, but this is the same church in Spain. I want to show at least one from Spain. This one is in France. This is a photograph I took myself. This is an original photograph in the Kremlin in Moscow. This is the one where I was told it was bad paint. Turned from white to black over the years, and Jesus got an afro because of that paint. <laughs> paint is a remarkable thing. Now, here's an interesting story. This one I took in a place called uh, Ephesus, in Turkey, in front of Mary's house. And I went to Turkey. I met these black women. I was so excited. Uh, but on my itinerary, which I kept changing, they said Mary's house. Mary's house. I said, well, I don't want to go to Mary's house. And so the travel agent said, don't worry. I'll change the itinerary. And I'll give you a new copy. And the next day, I'd get a new copy. And Mary's house is on there. And I said, but I said I didn't want to go. This is not free, is it? They said, no, I'll change it. The next day, new itinerary, Mary's house. So he says, oh, don't worry about it, Dr. Rashidi. We're not going. One morning, one Sunday, when we pull up in front of this place, I asked the tour guide, what is this? Mary's house. <laughs> I said, damn, you know, do we need, I don't speak Turkish. And uh, so I said, all right. So these people believe that Mary was taken here after the crucifixion by John. And John is supposedly buried right up there. I saw his grave. That's what they say. And so you have all these people lined up to get in Mary's house. I figured, well, I might as well go. I'm here now. And I asked the guy, should I take my camera? I had one, expo I think three or four exposures left. And he says, well, you might as well. You can always get some film. We go in there, and this little nun is in front of Mary's house. She doesn't even look at me as I walk in there. She's just by the door. I didn't want to be in there anyway because I didn't believe the story. I was a skeptic. 
But I said, I'm here. So I go in there, and a big sign says, no photography allowed. You're familiar with those signs by now. And it also said, no talking in Mary's house, because there were so many people there. I was ready to go. And all at once, I saw this black Madonna. And so I whispered to my guy, I said, I wonder how old it is. And he says, well, wait a minute, I'll ask him. And I said, don't do that. But he went anyway. And I said, well, I might as well follow him. She might say something interesting. So she admonished him. She said, Didn't you, don't you see the sign? No talking aloud. So he says, well, my employer, pointing to me, wants, uh, has a question. He wants to know how old it is. She says, well, very indignant, still has not looked at me. She says, if you want to speak for a moment or two, we can go outside. So the nun left. I followed her and my guide, and we're outside. And she says, it's black because the black represents power. I, I thought that was pretty good. And so I said, let's go. And then she kept talking. And she says, and the hands in this position mean this, and the hands in this position means that. Still hasn't even looked at me. I don't exist. You may have had that experience before. Mm -hmm. And so um, she goes on and on. And finally, I said, you know, like the monkey can talk. Uh, I'm the boss here. I said, I've seen a few of these. She, she looks at me for the first time. She says, really? And I said, yeah. I said, I've seen them in Russia. I've seen them in Costa Rica. I've seen them in France. I've seen them in Spain. She says, really? I said, yeah. And I said, now, where exactly is this from? She says, well, it came from Ethiopia or Egypt about 500 years ago. But before that, it was in a place called Le Puy in France. I said, you know, I wanted to see that statue for 20 years. My first wife was actually a scholar in her own right and did a whole paper, a scholarly paper, on that black Madonna. And there it was in Mary's house, a place I didn't want to go. So I started talking about it. I said, you know, the Second Crusade was launched from this place. And Joan of Arc's mother used to pray in front of this Madonna. And by this time, this nun is really excited. So she says, wait just a minute. I said, well, what's up here? Hopefully she ain't going to get the police. She said, wait just a minute. So she ran inside and brought the statue outside, pulled it off the altar. I said, can I photograph it? She said, yeah. I said, can I touch it? She says, yeah. I started to ask her, could I have it? But I knew <laughs> that was going too far. And then she did something else. And by this time, all kinds of people are around. There are Germans, there are Italians, there's French, there's Spanish, there's Greeks, there's Turks, and they're all looking at me. And so I'm, my ego, which you know I have a little bit of, started to get the best of me. I hadn't lectured in a while. I started lecturing on the black Madonna, and all these people are around me. So she put the Madonna down right in front of me and went back in Mary's house. Now, you know what I was thinking about. I'm wondering how this would look on my dresser in San Antonio. But I also thought the army would be after me. And there it is. That's a true story. This is the last one from that phase. And then the Moors, and we're finished. I'm already over time, but I couldn't help tell those stories. You may remember this from the church in Chartres. That's St. John up there in the stained glass windows in Paris, reminder of Dessert Club last year. Finally, the Moors. This is on the cover of the book, The Golden Age of the Moor. This is a Moor soldier in, uh, I think, the 20th century, black man. Is this the Tureg? What'd you say? Tureg? That's who that is? All right. Armed to the gills. This is the famous painting that we saw again. And I've heard some people say that they have this in their house. Yeah? You like that, huh? All right, let's leave it at that. Now, here's a good one. And then we have the historic one. Now, I want you to look at this one carefully and compare this to what you saw on the ceiling yesterday. These are Moorish noblemen in a book called The Chess Book of King Afonso the Wise, Spanish King. Black men playing chess in Spain, Moorish Spain, with a white servant and a black servant. Now, check that out. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> Debate? I don't think so. There it is. 800 years old from Spain. I think it's African, and I think it's African because the queen is the most important piece. That's what I think. African women historically have occupied very high positions. Now, if you play chess, you know it's the king you're supposed to go after. But the king is old and slow. He don't get around too good anymore. The queen is the real power on the board. I'm the sort of person, if I'm playing chess and I lose my queen, I just knock all the pieces over. <laughs> Say, let's start again. 
Okay? So I think, yeah, but I, I can't say that with any degree of confidence, but it may be. Okay, interesting. But these are emirs. These are noblemen. All right, let me finish up because it's getting late. I know you guys want to eat. This is Gibraltar, Tariq's Mountain. I got this from a National Geographic. You'll see it again when we go back to Tarifa tomorrow. Mm, is it? Well, it's identified in this book as uh, the Rock of Gibraltar. Don't spoil it, Gary, okay? Now, you, you're doing good so far. I, I like you, okay? Let's keep it that way. All right. The Alhambra, that's the Alhambra at night. You saw it from the cave, and you can see the snow in the mountains, a very nice piece. There's the rampart, the fortress. I climbed up there the first time. I don't think, I don't know if they let people go up there anymore, or we just didn't go. Did you? Yeah. Yeah. But after that long haul yesterday, I don't know if we were talking about going up there. And then you remember this. I don't know why I didn't bring an image of the Mesquita. But anyway, this is from Sevilla. This is a place we won't go, and this is magnificent too. This is the largest city in the southern part of Spain, and this is um, this monument, originally a minaret, right, that is converted tower. into a church? It's a, tower. a tower. It's a tower. Anyway, this is the most impressive monument in that city, Sevilla, in southern Spain. And then you have these images right here. This is the flag of Sardinia. And these are Moors' heads. If I were to show you the flag of Corsica, it would just be one Moors' head like that. Now, do those look like black folk? I know that's a rhetorical question. This is an interesting one that I found in Prague in the Czech Republic. And these, this is a Moor in chains. Now, many of those Moors were scattered to other parts of Europe. For example, you have the story of Swart Pete. Swart Pete, or Black Peter, is the story of a Moorish orphan boy who was adopted by Santa Claus and trained to stuff the Christmas stockings. In other words, what happened to those Moors? Some of them went back to Africa, but others were scattered in various parts of Europe, like this one, for example. This is called the Moor of Peter the Great. This is the great-grandfather of Alexander Sergeyevich Pushkin, the father of Russian literature, who was adopted as a child by the Tsar of Russia. And he gave him his name, Petrovich, or son of Peter. He's born in Cameroon. And he was sent to France for an education, and he took another name. He took the name Hannibal. And he adopted as his emblem an African war elephant. This is 300 years ago in Russia. Now, that's serious consciousness. And his great-grandson never forgot about his African ancestor. I've done a lot of study on Pushkin. Of all the black folk in the history of Russia, Pushkin is my man. People have done PhD dissertations on one hour of Pushkin's life. Pushkin was so important that when he died, many Russians stopped their clocks because they wanted to remember the exact time they heard Pushkin died. A remarkable person. He is the Shakespeare of Russia. And this is my favorite image of Pushkin right here. Really? He's called the father of Russian literature because he wrote in Russian when most Russian intellectuals were writing in French. And he was a man of the people. This is in uh, Pushkin's house in St. Petersburg who I would not go anymore because racism is so rampant in Russia right now, a black person could be assaulted just walking down the street. An African or an Asian, it happens all the time. And Putin will not speak out against that. Now, this is Pushkin as an adult. He died as a result of wounds inflicted on a duel, in a duel in 1837, defending his wife's honor or lack of honor. Um, he's a great poet, and he wrote prose, too. His, my favorite poem by Pushkin is called I Loved You Once. And it begins, I loved you once, and my heart will not be still. And he talks about a love affair he had. But you know, as adults, uh, just because you fall in love and it doesn't work out, that doesn't mean you cease to love that person. And Pushkin was writing a letter to this woman saying, I loved you once, and the love is still there. But don't worry. I'm not going to bother you with it, but it's something I wanted you to know. It's an immortal poem. The problem with Pushkin is it doesn't translate very well into English anyway. And one more thing about Pushkin, just a light-skinned African by my perspective. In his office, in his study, you find these two statues. He died, he was born in May, in the end of May 1799. I went to Russia to speak at the University of Moscow on the occasion of his 200th anniversary. It was a big thing. Hundreds of thousands of Russians turned out, and I gave a good one. 
Now here, of course, I would have said that if it was the worst speech that ever I ever gave, but it I was good. Now, I found in his studies two of these images, black men bareheaded breaking the chains of slavery. He was an abolitionist, and he's very concerned about slavery in the Americas. Pushkin was a remarkable person. Look at this one. This one is called St. Maurice. The name Maurice means like a moor. These are Moors who converted or, or identified not as Muslims, but as Christians. He is patron saint of the Roman Empire for 300 years. This is in a museum, not in front of in a museum, but in front of a cathedral in Magdeburg in eastern Germany, about an hour train ride east of Berlin. I wanted to go there the last time I was in Germany. People said, don't go. If you do, go with somebody, and whatever you do, don't be out at night by yourself on the streets because the skinheads and neo-Nazis are very vicious. You hear about people being beaten to death. But look at what I would have seen. I remember doing this, a presentation showing this slide in San Antonio, where I live about three months out of the year, a few years ago. And I had a, a these were for children. I didn't get paid a cent, but it was, I knew it was the right thing to do. And these were kids right off the street, very you know, aggressive and, and antsy. And so I said, OK, I know how to work with you guys. I'm going to let you help me operate the projector. And so I got the blackest, darkest kid in there to help me do the most work. His name was Danny. And Danny had the most energy. Okay? If he was a teacher, you all would have sent him to special ed. And Danny was doing fine until I showed this slide. And Danny jumped straight out of his seat like he had been shot and said, he looks like an ape. He looks like a monkey. And the sad part about it was he looked just like Danny. You see what I'm talking about? How our image of our own physical beauty has been deformed and maimed? You understand what I'm saying? This is a black knight in France. A moor. This is Sir Morian. I didn't make this up now. Finally, I thought that these were moors, but I found out they were crusaders from Ethiopia who fought with the Arabs at the defense of Jerusalem in, I think, 1184. This is the mural you may have seen and you may remember seeing in the Pantheon in Paris. And this is a, a good photo. You remember? This is Benjamin Banneker, who supposedly designed Washington, D.C., who's described as a Moor. This is another one of the images that we saw, like yesterday, one of the three wise men. You look like two of them are black to me, but one for sure. Come to pay homage to the Christ child with frankincense, gold, and myrrh. This is just another image from early Europe. This one is from England. Some of those Moors went to England. And, and you can find all of that in the book, Golden Age of the Moor. This is an African. I don't know if he's a Moor, but it's just an African in early Europe. This is a Swedish court secretary. His name is Adolf Baden. He was court secretary, or he lived from 1760 to 1814 in Sweden. Now, what's a brother doing in Sweden from 1760 to 1814 playing chess with a jerry curl, no less. And he must have a remarkable story to tell. What if he could talk? This is John Blanc, regarded as the greatest trumpet player in the world. This is in 1513, right after the fall of Granada. And he is the personal trumpet player of King Henry, I think, the 11th. And he won music awards at the Westminster Music Festival in the 16th century the Wynton Marcellus, Miles Davis, Satchmo of his day. And these are just in with how history can be falsified in the popular imagination. You don't have to watch the Discovery Channel, the History Channel, the Learning Channel to get misinformation, but it's projected in the popular imagination. Of course, we all know this is Hor Market or the Great Sphinx and Khafre's Pyramid here, and then you can compare this to the Luxor Hotel in Las Vegas. You see? You see how the consciousness is tempered with this kind of thing. And this is another interesting one. This is a, the star called Sirius B. And this is taken from Van Sertimo's book, Blacks in Science. Uh, this is, that's a photograph on the top, which was done, I think, 1970. And then you see the drawing of Sirius B done by the people called the Dogon in Mali. They have a 700-year history of Sirius B. You can't see it with the naked eye. It is a companion star of Sirius. Sirius is so bright, it blocks us out. But these Africans can tell you not only about his orbital patterns, 
they can tell you what it's made out of. They say it's a white dwarf, a star that has imploded upon, it, upon itself. Western astronomers only noticed it in the 1890s. They photographed it for the first time in 1970. And yet these so-called African primitives in this Muslim country have known about it for 700 years. So Western science called this phenomenon the serious mystery. And they can't figure out how these Africans might know something that Europeans do not. One of the scholars who did work, Carter G. Woodson, very handsome, uh, excellent photograph. Carter Woodson, again, wrote a book on uh, the African presence in the Iberian Peninsula or edited a book, I think, in the 1920s or 30s. This is the one I told you about. This is new. I love this. This is Malcolm X as a young minister in the Nation of Islam shaking hands with the esteemed historian Joel Augustus Rogers from Jamaica. One of the reasons I decided I was going to visit 65 countries and I'm now up to 68 is because one of my teachers told me Joel A. Rogers went to 60. And so I believe that each generation should build on the ones who come before. And that's why I have faith in the dessert club because we're building a whole generation of people who are going to build on our successes and foundations. And Rogers, I think, is one of the greatest historians we've ever produced. And finally, this one right here. She's not a Muslim. She's not a Moor. She's a little girl from the Gambia. And she's looking at each and every one of you saying, what y'all going to do now? You got the information. It's not enough just to feel good. You must do something with it because the eyes of the world are upon you. Thank you very much. And again, give Gary a round of applause because he's the one who did the most to secure the projector. Give it up. <laughs>